The topic for this video is Module 6, Serving Client Needs, Chapter 16, Investors and Their Needs, for the CFA Institute Investment Foundations Program. So here we are in Module 6, Serving Client Needs. You can see there are two chapters, Chapter 16, the topic for this video today, Investors and Their Needs, and then there's Chapter 17, Investment Management. I must say these are two of my favorite chapters. It's where a lot of things come together, things that we've been studying in the debt securities, the equi equity securities, the quantitative concepts, the investment vehicles. It all starts coming together now uh, because we start moving into uh, investment policy statements and portfolios. So it's, uh, it's a really good um, module. Anyhow, you can see that uh, it's 5% weighted on the exam, so that would translate into approximately six questions, although they do say on the website that the weightings uh, may not be exact, but anyhow, uh, let's just go with the fact that they could be exact. Um, 120 questions on the exam times 5%, six questions. You can see there are uh, 12 learning outcome statements. There's five in this chapter, seven in the next, and um, only 76 practice questions in the learning ecosystem. Chapter 16 has 35 questions in the learning ecosystem, and chapter 17 has 41, okay? So great module and two good chapters coming up. The learning outcome statements for this chapter are A, describe the importance of identifying investors' needs to the investment process. B, identify, describe, and compare types of individual and institutional investors. C, compare defined benefit pension plans and defined contribution pension plans. Learning outcome statement D is explain factors that affect investor needs. And then finally, the last learning outcome statement for the chapter E is describe the rationale for and structure of investment policy statements in serving client needs. Learning outcome statement A is describe the importance of investor needs to the investment process, okay? So before we jump into the uh, chapter, this is my own slide actually, and I'm showing here the investment management process or the portfolio management process. So if you wanna understand the importance of identifying investor needs to the process, I thought it'd be good to just start with a big overview of what the entire process is, okay? Uh, chapter 16 is investors and their needs, and chapter 17 moves into the investment management. So these two chapters are really covering the entire investment process. So that's why it's a good idea to start with this. So if we're looking at the um, uh, investment process, number one is to discover the investor risk and return profile and philosophy. We're going to be spending some time on that in this video for sure. Step number two is determining the investor's objectives and constraints. And I wrote here, that's KYC, know your customer. Okay, that's very important in the investment industry to know your customer. It's a requirement. And it's all about uh, their risk and return profile, their philosophy, what their objectives are, what their constraints are. In some cases, uh, geographic focus may be established. And then, as you can see, once you're moving on from the investors and the needs, you're starting to move over to the investment management uh, part. Uh, step number four is develop an asset allocation mix strategy. So that's setting up the strategic asset allocation. Uh, number five is then developing an investment policy statement. And we do talk about that in this, not only this video in chapter 16, but also in chapter 17. And then after you've uh, developed it, it's time to implement it. And that's the investment management. So you're going to implement an asset, uh, asset mix. Step number six. Step number seven is to monitor not only the investment universe, but also the investor, because we've mentioned uh, conditions change for the investor. And um, the investment universe changes as well. So you're monitoring not only the investment universe, but also the investor. And then finally, uh, step number eight is evaluate and communicate the portfolio performance. So we start to see a bit of, uh, you know, some chapters on performance in the uh, next module. Okay, so that's a overview of the investment management process. And the first learning outcome, we'll be talking about uh, the importance of identifying the investor needs up here, discovering the risk and return profile, philosophy, objectives and constraints, etc. So this slide is looking at uh, investor needs. And when we talk about uh, investors, we're going to be making basically two broad categories, which is individuals, and then we look at uh, institutions, okay? 
So they're going to share, in terms of client characteristics, there's going to be some similarities, but there's also going to be uh, differences. So, you know, both individuals and institutions will have their objectives. But here, when we're looking at this row, in terms of the client characteristics, we're really uh, more looking at individuals, okay? Uh, so with, with, with regards to individuals and families, we're going to look at their, uh, you know, getting to know your customer, KYC, gathering data, quantitative and qualitative data. We're going to get information on the financial resources. We're also going to get information with regards to the personal situation, size of the family, uh, age, et cetera, uh, financial expertise, and attitudes with regards to risk and other, uh, you know, with regards to savings and investment, et cetera, just some of the characteristics, uh, attitudes with regards to investing that are, um, that are maybe perhaps unique to that customer. And then there might be other unique uh, factors, okay? So in general, uh, the one thing about individuals is that no, no, most individuals are not the same. Uh, you know, it's a very diverse, uh, when we're looking at client characteristics, there's a ton of diversity when you're looking at individual account. But institutions, in general, on average, you can sort of lump them into categories like pension funds or endowments or insurance companies or banks. And, uh, and you're going to see the characteristics are maybe going to be a little bit closer, not as much diversity as we see with the individuals. But anyhow, regardless of individual clients or institutional clients, we, uh, we're going to look at the investment needs, and that's in terms of what services they require and uh, ultimately what uh, investments are appropriate. Learning outcome statement B is identify, describe, and compare types of individual and institutional investors. So as I had uh, previously mentioned, investors are not a homogenous group. There's a lot of diversity. Both individual and institutional investors have distinct characteristics. Individual investors are often differentiated based on their resources. The term retail investor can be used to refer to all individual investors, but it's quite common to use the term to refer to individual investors with modest resources to invest. Many investment firms make a distinction between their retail clients, more affluent clients with larger amounts, and high net worth and ultra high net worth investors with the largest amounts of investable assets. Indeed, as I've shown before in a previous uh, video, the Capgemini World Wealth Report, the definition for a high net worth individual is one million US dollar of investable assets, not including their personal residence, okay? So there are uh, categorizations for high net worth, ultra high net worth, et cetera, and we're gonna get into that in uh, more detail later. But just understand that individuals are uh, differentiated based on their resources. Moving on to institutional investors, Institutional investors invest to advance their missions, and they include pension plans, endowment funds, foundations, trusts, governments, and sovereign wealth funds, and non-financial companies. Uh, institutional investors that invest to provide financial services to their clients include investment companies, banks, and insurance companies. Remember, insurance companies are big investors. On this slide, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking about individual investors. And uh, individual investors are often differentiated based on their resources. Uh, most uh, individuals and families will have relatively modest amounts to invest. Others, more affluent individuals, will have larger amounts. The term retail investor over here uh, may be used to refer to all individual investors. That's why it's on the outside of the circle but it's also quite common to use the term to refer to individual investors with more modest resources to invest, okay? There is no defined standard in the industry to categorize individual investors. As I said, the cap Gemini high net worth individuals is one million investable assets, but there's no defined standard throughout the industry. Each investment firm designates its own categories and values within those categories. So uh, here, the important point is the services offered by investment firms and the investments available will typically vary by the amount of money that the client has to invest, okay? For example, some specialist funds may require minimum sizes of investments 
for example, $100,000 or a million dollars. Some portfolio management services may have minimum fees, making them uneconomical for smaller account sizes. Additional aspects of the personal situations of individual investors, such as age and family obligations, will also differ and affect their investment needs and decision making. The expecting holding period, time or investment horizon for investments, risk tolerance and other circumstances also affect the investor's needs. So again, for individual investors, it's a very diverse uh, group, okay? Individual, and also, individual investors may vary in their level of investment knowledge and expertise, okay? Some individual investors have relatively limited investment knowledge and expertise. Others are more knowledgeable, perhaps as a result of their education or work experience. Because individual investors are often thought of as less knowledgeable and less experienced than institutional investors, regulators in many countries try to protect them by putting restrictions on the investments that can be sold to them. An investment firm or division focusing on high net worth investors may have fewer clients uh, than its retail counterpart, but higher average account balances. Investor assets may still be invested in funds, but some high net worth investors will prefer their own segregated accounts, known as separately managed accounts. Wealthy clients may have higher expectations of customer service than retail customers, and usually the service that is provided to them is more personalized. Next, we can move on to ultra high net worth investors and family offices. Very wealthy individuals usually employ professionals who help them manage their investments, future estates, and legal affairs. These professionals often work in a family office, which is a private company that manages the financial affairs of one or more members of a family or multiple families. So they can be called a family office or sometimes it's called a, a multi-family office. And uh, they pay especially, in a, in a family office, they pay especially close attention to personal and estate tax issues that may significantly affect the family's wealth and its ability to pass wealth on to future generations or to charitable institutions. Now we're moving on to institutional investors. There are many different types of institutional investors with varying investment requirements and constraints. Some institutional investors manage their investments internally and employ investment professionals whose job it is to select the investments. So for example, here in Canada, in Ontario where I live, you could look at the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. They're considered to be an institutional investor and they have their own investment professionals uh, whose job it is to select the investments. And if you ha take a look at their website, uh, which we may do, uh, you can see it's a fantastic example of all the activities that they're involved in. Other institutional investors outsource the investment of the portfolio to one or more external investment firms. An example of this may be a university endowment. A university has had donations made to it, they have millions and millions of dollars that needs to be managed, but they're going to outsource that portfolio to an external investment firm, okay? So the choice between internal and external management will often be driven by the size of the institutional investor, with larger institutional investors better able to afford the resources required for internal management. Some institutional investors will adopt a mix model, managing some assets internally, but also outsourcing assets to external managers, for example, for alternative investments. We see that with a number of sovereign wealth funds, for example. They'll have a large team of investment professionals managing uh, some investments, but they'll also outsource to private equity, venture capital, um, you know, uh, hedge fund managers uh, uh, for, for external management. Institutional investors that choose to outsource investment management still have complex decisions to make in terms of what managers to appoint. They may use some internal expertise to make manager selection decisions or they may employ a consultant. So just quickly to bring the real world into the classroom, I want to show an example of an institutional investor. Here's a perfect example, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan in Ontario, Canada. And uh, if you just scroll down, um, Ontario Teachers Pension Plan is an independent organization that pays defined benefit pensions and invests plan assets 
on behalf of 323,000 active and, and retired members. Those are people that have been involved in the teaching in, uh, industry in Ontario. So if I click here on investments and we look just uh, quickly at the investment teams to see sort of the activities that they're uh, uh, working in, capital markets, global strategic relationships, infrastructure and natural resources, total fund management, private capital, public equities, real estate, then they have a London office which is covering uh, EMEA, and then they have a Hong Kong office as well, okay? And then if I click here, investments performance, just to give you some idea of the size, you can see that uh, strong net asset growth since inception, the end of 2017, they have $189.5 billion in uh, net assets, okay? So that's, that's in Canadian dollars. And then if we scroll down, we can see there's some return information. Total fund net return, 10 years, 7.6%. Since inception, 9.9%. They have a benchmark, some type of benchmark that they're comparing the return against, 6.9% on the 10 years. Uh, so again, this gets into the point of, uh, in terms of expectations, uh, you know, you can, this gives you some, uh, this gives you some reality to a huge pension plan that's got professional managers with, what has their 10-year return been? It's been 7.6%, uh, uh, okay? Then you can scroll down, you can see it's got net investments and rates of return by asset class. These are some of the things that we've talked about. Uh, you know, this is why I said this chapter brings a lot together. Equity, they've got it split between publicly traded equities and non-publicly traded equities. That would be private equity, fixed income, which is bonds. And then you can see they have uh, do have some investing in terms of commodities, uh, real assets, real estate, infrastructure, because they're a big uh, institutional investor. They can get involved in infrastructure. Credit would be corporate bonds, absolute return strategies, some type of hedge funds. And then you can see they've got negative mar uh, money market because they're doing a little bit of uh, borrowing, okay? So continuing with institutional investors, we're going to look a little bit more detail at endowment funds and foundations. Endowment funds and foundations are also significant institutional investors in many countries. Endowment funds are long-term funds of not-for-profit institutions such as universities, colleges, schools, museums, theaters, opera companies, hospitals, and clinics. Foundations are grant-making institutions funded by gifts and by the investment income that they produce. They typically have a charitable or philanthropic purpose and receive gifts from donors interested in supporting their activities. In many countries, donations to these organizations are tax-deductible for the donors. Endowment funds are usually intended to exist in perpetuity and as such as are regarded as very long-term investors. The longer the time horizon, the higher the risk. We've seen that, uh, and we're going to talk about that more in later detail. But that's something to be aware of with the endowment funds. They have a very long time horizon. Most organizations with endowment funds hire professional investment managers to manage the funds. Some manage portions of their funds internally. In some cases, though, an investment management, uh, in some cases, through an investment management company that they own. Uh, endowments uh, and foundations will also outsource to third parties. And this is a very key thing to understand is that many endowments and foundations establish spending rules. For example, they may establish spending goals within a percentage range of their assets. Okay, that's very important to understand that they not only get donations and they manage the fund to grow, that every year they need to, they've got spending rules. You know, it may be 2% of their assets or 3% of their assets has to be spent every year, okay? So often the challenge lies in balancing long-term growth with income or cash flow requirements. Some will be able to raise funds on an ongoing basis, whereas others will be restricted from raising more capital. Some endowments and foundations are required to spend a fixed portion of the portfolio every year, whereas others have more flexibility to vary spending based on their circumstances. So these differences have implications for how the institution's assets are invested. Now we're moving on to governments and sovereign wealth funds and non-financial companies as examples of other in institutional investors, okay? So starting with the sovereign wealth funds, governments receive money from collecting taxes or selling bonds. Or if we look at many governments in the Middle East, uh, Russia, Norway, 
They also have sovereign wealth funds that are based from their income from exporting oil, okay? So when governments do not have uh, to spend this money immediately, if they have a surplus, they usually invest it. Some governments have accumulated enormous surpluses from selling natural resources that they control or from financing the trade of goods and services. So they've created sovereign wealth funds to invest these surpluses for the benefit of current and future generations of their citizens. Sovereign wealth funds typically invest in long-term securities and assets. Again, sovereign wealth funds are going to have a very long time horizon because it's saving for future generations. Non-financial companies produce goods and non-financial services for their customers. Non-financial companies invest money that they do not presently require to run their businesses. This, is mo this money may be invested short-term, mid-term, or long-term. The corporate treasurer usually manages the short-term investment assets. Long-term investments are usually managed under the direction of the chief financial officer or the chief investment officer if the company has one. Most companies invest directly in the shares of and bonds of their suppliers and in the shares of potential merger partners to strengthen, uh, to strengthen their relationships with them. Practitioners call these investments strategic investments. Just very quickly, uh, bring the real world into the classroom. If you wanted more information on sovereign wealth funds, here I'm at the website for the Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute, okay? And if you click here, Sovereign Wealth Fund uh, Rankings, you can see just uh, largest sovereign wealth funds by assets under management. You can see, you can scroll down. Number one is Norway. The fu uh, fund started in 1990. The uh, origin uh, for the proceed, you know, the funds is from oil. And you can see that there's, uh, you know, over a trillion dollars. And this is usually approximated. In some cases, uh, the sovereign wealth funds do not disclose their assets under management. It's an estimate. So, for example, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, ADIA, they have an annual report every year, which is a fantastic annual report that shows their, uh, you know, their um, asset allocation targets, and it shows their geo by, by asset class and by geography, but they do not disclose their assets under management. That is a, uh, this is an estimate, okay? Uh, Kuwait Investment Authority, uh, again, that would be an estimate. And you can see the, the, the uh, funds going into the account are coming from oil. So again, this is just a quick, uh, I want to show you just very quickly, Sovereign Wealth Fund Institute, you can find in, uh, some information with regards to sovereign wealth funds. Now we're moving on to investment companies. Investment companies include mutual funds, hedge funds, and private equity funds. These companies exist solely to hold investments on behalf of their shareholders, partners, or unit holders. Units usually refer to shares and bonds for equity and debt securities, respectively. Investment companies were also discussed in the investment vehicles chapter, you remember. This is why I said things are starting to come together now in chapter uh, 16 and 17. Uh, these companies are called pooled investment vehicles because investors in these companies pool their money for common management. Mutual funds pool the assets of many investors into a single investment vehicle, which is professionally managed and benefits from economies of scale. Hedge funds and private equity funds can similarly be considered institutional investors that manage private investment pools and as uh, investment vehicles. They are distinguished by their use of strategies beyond the scope of most traditional mutual funds. I did not show this website on the uh, chapter for investment vehicles, but I thought I'd just uh, put it in here because, again, we've been talking about uh, investment companies uh, that, that hold mutual funds. If you want more information on the uh, mutual fund industry, particularly in the U.S., this is a very good website, ICI.org, www.ici.org. It's the Investment Company Institute. And in particular, if you go here, Publications and, Re and Resources, click here on Fact books and you download this uh, 2018 company fact book it's a fantastic uh, resource to learn more about the uh, mutual fund industry and if I just quick uh, click quickly on the uh, HTML book you can see the chapters here chapter one worldwide regulated open-end funds so that gives you a bigger scope than just USA but chapter two USA registered investment companies Number three, U.S. mutual funds. Number four, exchange-traded funds. Number five, closed-end funds. 
Uh, number six, U.S. funds, fees, and expenses. This has been coming down over time. Chapter seven, characteristics of U.S. mutual fund owners. And chapter eight, U.S. retirement and education uh, savings. So a fantastic resource if you want to learn more about uh, funds. Now we're moving on to insurance companies. Insurance companies comprise another very important category of institutional investor. Insurance companies collect premiums from the individuals and companies they insure. Premiums are payments that insurance companies require to provide insurance coverage. Some of these premiums are put into reserve funds from which insurance companies pay out claims. The premiums in the reserve funds are invested in highly diversified portfolios of securities and assets that aim to ensure that sufficient funds are always available to satisfy all claims. Regulators often set requirements to restrict the types of investments that insurance companies can hold. There are two main types of insurance companies. One type is property and casualty insurance companies, which protect their policyholders from the financial loss caused by such incidents as accidents and theft. They have short-term horizons and relatively unpredictable payouts. Therefore, they prefer shorter-term investments that are more conservative and liquid. So that's a very important characteristic of property and casualty insurance companies. Short-time horizons, unpredictable payouts. Therefore, they have to have shorter-term investments, more conservative and liquid. Um, lower risk when we say more conservative. The other, type is life, uh, the other type of insurance company is life insurance companies, which make payments to the policyholder's beneficiaries in the event that the policyholder dies while the insurance coverage is in force. They have longer-term time horizons, more predictable payouts, and therefore have more latitude to invest in riskier assets. Insurance companies try to match their investments to their liabilities. This process is called asset liability matching and it reduces the risk that the company will fail to pay its claims. Most large insurance companies manage their investments in-house. Learning Outcome Statement C is compare defined benefit pension plans and defined contribution pension plans. So it's important to note that there's quite a few questions in the learning ecosystem regarding defined benefit and defined contribution pension plans. Definitely I would expect to see a question uh, on this on the on the exam okay so you can see there's going to be some differences and some similarities between defined benefit plans and defined contribution plans it's important that you understand so this slide is a basically a good summary it's pretty much a good example of what I would have as a flashcard but then I would even reduce this from sentences to some uh, key terms like for example defined uh, benefit pension plans uh, this third bullet pension may be adjusted for inflation I would just, my bullet point would be adjusted for inflation, okay? Three words, and that's how I make my flashcards. Anyhow, let's start first with the defined benefit plans. Defined benefit plans promise a defined annual amount to their retired members. So that amount is uh, going to be basically guaranteed. The defined amount is guaranteed, but it, it typically varies by member based on such factors such as years of service, annual compensation when employed. There's sometimes a formula, uh, you know, how many years you've worked there, and then it's taking an average of your five best last years and coming up with some percentage that's going to be paid out, okay? And again, the third point we already mentioned, uh, the pension may be adjusted for inflation over time. In, this, in a defined benefit plan, the employer will make the contributions to the pension fund to fulfill the pro uh, promise. So it's the obligation of the employer to uh, make contributions. Employees may also be asked to contribute. They might have some par uh, partial contribution. With defined benefit pension funds, particularly those of uh, government-sponsored plans, uh, they're amongst the largest of the institutional investors. So I showed you in Canada, in Ontario, OTPP, which is a pension plan for, uh, it's a defined benefit pension plan for teachers. And then also at the government level in Canada, we have the CPP, which is the Canadian Pension Plan. Okay, and that also is a very big organization that has large assets and big um, institutional investment teams working there. 
Pension funds may invest in equity securities, debt securities, and alternative investments because they typically have long time horizons. So again, I said you can go to the website of uh, any pension fund, uh, perhaps if there's one in your country, and go have a look at what they're investing in, see what their investment teams are. I've showed you an example of the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan is a pretty good example. And uh, finally, the last bullet point here is that in a defined benefit plan, this is a key point. The employer bears the risk that the investments made by the pension fund fail to perform as expected. Over here, this, and we can start maybe from the bottom and work our way back up, when we moved over to the defined contribution pension plans, it's the employee that bears the risk. So that's, that's one of the key differences, often gets tested even at CFA level one. Key thing to understand that in a defined benefit pension plan, they're, they're, they're promising you to pay you defined annual benefit and an annual amount. It depends on uh, you know the, the years of service, annual compensation, et cetera. And it's the employer that's bearing the risk. And so defined benefit plans are becoming less common around the globe and are being uh, replaced by defined contribution plans. So moving over here to defined contribution plans, the uh, pension sponsor typically uh, contributes an agreed upon amount. That's the defined contribution and that might be some percentage of salary to an account to set up for each employee. The account is set up for each employee. And employees also generally contribute their own to their own retirement plan accounts, usually through uh, further payroll deductions, okay? So these uh, contributions are then invested and those decisions are typically made by the employee. They've, they're given some choices and they have to choose. I'm gonna choose a growth fund or et cetera. So over here with a defined contribution, pension sponsor contributes an agreed amount uh, and then the employees gonna contribute through payroll deductions. The employees are making investment decisions. In defined contribution plans, the member or the, employ, uh, or the employee bears the risk. So that's the key difference. Defined benefit plan, employer bears risk. Uh, and they're, they're managing the fund and the, uh, you know, the fund manager, et cetera, is making the decisions. Over here, defined contribution, the contributions primarily coming from the employee, employee primarily making their decisions with some advice from, a, uh, from a, uh, the fund manager, but they have to make some choices. And uh, therefore, in a defined contribution plan, it's the employee that's bearing the risk that the pension account's investments fail to perform as expected. And so if the retirement fund is less than expected, the employee may, may have to do, make do with less retirement income or possibly defer the retirement. So much more risk here for employees with regards to the re, uh, retirement when they're part of a defined contribution pension plan. So a quick practice question from the le learning ecosystem to check our understanding. It's classified at the difficult level. Defined benefit plans often shift to holding more liquid assets in their portfolio when A, equity prices fall, B, taxes are due on the plan's investments gains, or C, pension payments exceed new contributions to the plan. Okay, yeah, I thought this question was a bit difficult myself. Uh, hopefully you get an easier one on the test. But anyhow, defined benefit uh, pension plans often shift to holding more liquid assets in their portfolios when C, pension payments exceed new contributions to the plan. So defined benefit pension plans often shift to holding more liquid assets in their portfolio when pension payments exceed new, new contributions, they need the liquidity, okay? So uh, again, um, defined benefit pension plans, because it's a pension plan, can have a quite a long time horizon, but there is need for liquidity there in terms of paying out their pensions, okay? So it's saying here, shift to holding more liquid assets when pension payments exceed new contributions, so there's not new money coming into the plan, and they have to make the same pay payouts. So A and B were wrong. Uh, B, you, you should spot because taxes are due on the plan's investments. No, pension plans are typically tax-exempt. So continuing with individual and institutional investors, this is actually a CFA level one table from the curriculum, but uh, it applies, uh, you know, 100% to the investment foundations program as well. So I wanted to include it because uh, I think it's quite good. Uh, it's looking, num column number one is the, is the looking at the client, and then we're gonna look at the time horizon. We're gonna look at the risk tolerance. 
we're going to look at the income needs, and we're going to look at the liquidity needs. So this is a little bit above and beyond the call of duty at the in, uh, CFA Investment Foundations program, but I think it's fairly easy to understand. And I always like to sometimes go, uh, you know, extend myself beyond what I need to do, and then uh, to do what I'm required to do becomes a lot easier. Okay, so if we just start by looking at the individual investors, the time horizon it varies, and the risk tolerance varies. Uh, you know, uh, and that's the whole point is with individual investors, there's a lot more. Uh, it's not homogenous. There's a lot more diversity. Diversity, and so income needs again. It's all up to the individual. And it varies by individual. So everything, time horizon, risk tolerance, income needs, liquidity needs, it all varies. But when we move into the institutional investors, defined benefit pension plans, endowments and foundations, banks, insurance companies, and investment companies, we can make more general categorizations, uh, characterizations with regards to time horizon, risk tolerance, uh, income needs, and liquidity needs. Okay. So we don't have a lot on the uh, income needs in this chapter for the CFA uh, foundations, but there is on time horizon risk tolerance, and time horizon sort of drives the risk tolerance in uh, some extents because we saw with the uh, property and casualty um, uh, uh, time horizon, it's, it's, it's a short term for property and casualty, and it's long term for the life insurance, okay? So that would mean that the risk tolerance for a property and casualty is uh, quite a bit lower because of that unpredictable cash flows, et cetera, in terms of the payouts. Um, okay, so we, we this, these are things that we're looking at. So I think this kind of making up a little table like this for your flashcard would be uh, fairly beneficial. So you could see defined benefit pension plans, the time horizon, typically very long term. If it's a long term time horizon, it's typically higher a risk tolerance. And the interesting thing to note here in terms of the liquidity needs is quite low because the, um, you know, the amount of cash that they're paying out relative to the fund size, that's what that might surprise you. You think, oh, a pension fund, that's big liquidity. They're paying out all the, but actually this is why I circled that in red. That's something that tricks people up at CFA level one is that uh, in general, on average, the liquidity need of a defined pension benefit plan is considered to be low when you're comparing it to the total assets, okay? Uh, so anyhow, uh, um, you know, endowments and foundations, again, we said long-term time horizon, therefore higher uh, risk tolerance and fairly low liquidity because there might be some uh, small percentage, uh, you know, 2 to 3% that is, has to be paid out as spending uh, for an endowment or a foundation, okay? Moving on to banks, uh, banks shorter term uh, uh, time horizon because deposits are coming in and out. Uh, loans are of uh, maybe a shorter nature other than long-term mortgages, so the risk tolerance is lower, and the banks have a high uh, liquidity need to meet repayments of uh, deposits, so that's something that you would expect, okay? So then the insurance companies was split between the property and casualty and the life insurance, and uh, for insurance companies, the liquidity needs was high, again, to meet the claims. Finally, investment companies, again, varies by fund, varies by fund, varies by fund, but in terms of liquidity, high to meet redemptions. Anyhow, the point that I wanted to make on this is that you'll uh, have to understand for the institutional investors is that uh, they vary in terms of their time horizon, the risk tolerance, the liquidity needs, and we haven't really looked at the income needs, but uh, that's uh, you know just giving you some insight if you were to move ahead to uh, CFA level one, this is, you would see that start to see this material again. So just to be quick, I wanted to put uh, three questions here. One, two, three, with their solution all on the same page. It's all from CFA level one. So uh, I'm not doing this you know, to check your understanding. I just want to show you this is exactly how it's tested uh, from a question bank for uh, level one. So let's just go through it. It'll be a pretty good review, actually. Uh, in general, which of the following institutions will most likely have a high need for liquidity and a short uh, investment time horizon? A, banks. B, endowments, or C, defined benefit pension plans? Well, A is correct. Banks have a short-term horizon and high liquidity. Endowments have a longer-term time horizon, and so do defined benefit uh, pension plans. Okay, so again, this is a bit above and beyond the call of duty for the Investment Foundations program, but, uh, you know, why not? Uh, which is question number two, which of the following types of institutions is most likely to have a long investment time horizon 
and a higher level of risk tolerance? A, a bank. Well, no, we just saw that from number one. B, an endowment, or C, an insurance company. Well, B is correct. Endowments have a long time horizon and a high level of risk tolerance. So that's kind of connecting the time horizon to the uh, risk tolerance. Finally, the third question was, which of the following institutional investors are most likely to have a low tolerance for investment risk and relatively high liquidity needs? A, insurance company, B, charitable foundation, or C, defined ben uh, be benefit pension plan. And so you can see low tolerance for risk, high liquidity. Well, a charitable foundation, uh, no, not uh, high liquidity on a charitable foundation. We saw that as low liquidity <coughs> and um, also a uh, higher risk because a higher timeline. Defined benefit, pension plan, no, we saw that that was a low liquidity, which was a bit of something that you kind of had to understand. So the correct answer was A. A is correct because insurance companies need to be relatively conservative and are liquid given the necessity, uh, the necessity of paying uh, claims when due, unpredictable claims, okay? So just a nice little example of three practice questions from CFA level one. Uh, and how they're testing on the institutional, the characteristics of uh, institutional investors. Anyhow, we'll just finish this learning outcome statement with a question from the uh, learning ecosystem for the CFA Investment Foundations pro uh, program, and it's considered classified at the expert level. And the question is, which of the following is not a rationale investment firms use to differentiate individual investors by level of affluence? A. Appro apply appropriate regulatory restrictions, B, optimize administration of uh, client holdings, or C, provide portfolio management services that are economical. Yeah, I found that to be a bit of an uh, expert question. It's very wordy and uh, uh, not so easy to understand. Anyhow, A is correct. Uh, when you're looking at rationale that investment firms use to differentiate individual investors, this is one of the techniques that I use is I'll shorten the question, you know, try to just try to get into wording that I understand. So what are some of the rationales investment firms use to di differentiate indivi individual investors? Um, optimizing administration of client holdings. Yeah, we saw there's different categorizations. Uh, retail to higher net worth, and there's, that's gonna, there's going to be different administration with regards to the classification, and they're also going to provide portfolio management services that are economical. Not all customers the same, not all customers going to have access to the same level of services, okay? So A was correct. Um, the key reason to segment individual investors by level of wealth is to provide the appropriate level of services and vehicles given the client's needs, expectations, and fees associated with the size of the account. Regulatory restrictions may be applied to individuals with limited resources, but it's not a primary uh, driver behind the differentiation. So regulatory restrictions don't drive um, um, uh, client uh, individual investor differentiation. Now we're moving on to learning outcome statement D, which is explain factors that affect investors' needs. So we're going to look at some common factors that affect all investors' needs, okay? So each, individ uh, each investor, individual or institutional, has different investment objectives related to varied circumstances, attitudes, and constraints. Key factors to consider that are common to each investor, but that will vary by, uh, by investor, will include time horizon, return requirement and risk tolerance. Looking first at the required return, investors differ in how much return they need to meet their goals. The rate of return required before and after tax can be calculated using some goal for future wealth or portfolio value. For example, based on a client's age, initial investable assets, expected savings and tax situation, an advisor may calculate that a 6% rate of return before tax on investments is required for the individual investor to meet her goal of having a 500,000 euro portfolio value at retirement. So we do that using time value of money calculations is why, uh, why, why we learn that in um, you know, quantitative concepts. That's why I said you can see things are starting to come together when you, when you move into the uh, portfolio management, investment management. Uh, if the required rate of return seems unlikely to be achieved, the investor's goals may have to be revised or other factors such as the level of savings may have to be adjusted. 
So an investor may take a total return perspective, which makes no distinction between income, for example, dividends and interest, and capital gains, that is, increases in market value. The sources of return, changes in value or income, does not matter to a total return-oriented investor. Alternatively, an, inv an investor may distinguish between income and capital gains, seeking income for current spending, for example, someone who is retired wants to increase their income, or capital gains, which is for longer-term needs. The return requirement, particularly for a long-term horizon, should be specified in real terms. So that's a very key point. The return requirement for a long-term horizon should be specified in real terms, which means adjusting for the effect of inflation. This adjustment is important because it maintains the focus on what the accumulated portfolios will provide at the end of the time horizon. The investment manager or advisor has to be comfortable that the investor's desired rate of return is achievable within the related constraints. That's an important point. You have to be comfortable that the, uh, the investment manager has to be comfortable, the investor should be uh, comfortable as well, that the desired rate of return is achievable, it's realistic within the related constraints. Most clients would like high returns with low risks, but few investments have this expected profile. The advisor or manager has a role in counseling the client, educating the client. Typically, higher levels of expected return will require high levels of risk to be taken. And that's what we've seen. This is why I cut and pasted some of the charts that we've looked at in previous chapters, uh, where we looked at the uh, SBBI Ibbotson uh, yearbook, and we looked at the returns for small cap stock, large cap stocks, long-term corporate bonds, treasury bonds, T-bills, and inflation. And we looked at not only the returns, but also the risks, okay? So typically, higher levels of expected return require high levels of risk. Investors have, uh, who have accumulated significant assets may choose to invest their, uh, in riskier assets because they're capable of bearing the risk and able to withstand uh, losses, but they don't necessarily have to. Other investors have, who have already accumulated sufficient assets do not need high returns and can adopt a lower risk approach uh, with more certainty of meeting their goals. So that's uh, saying that uh, investors have accumulated uh, significant assets, they, they have more flexibility. They can choose to invest in riskier assets because they have the ability to, and they can, or they ch can choose not to, uh, so it's their choice. Investors, particularly individual investors, may adjust their holdings over time as their circumstances change. So just continuing with investors' objectives here, I've just added a little bit. It's again from uh, coming from the CFA uh, level one, but I think it's, uh, it's quite relevant. So again, uh, you know, when we're looking at the client's characteristics, we're looking here now at uh, the return objectives, okay? Uh, so return objectives, again, stated in absolute, can be stated in an absolute or relative basis. Uh, an example of an absolute objective, the client may want to achieve a particular percentage rate of return, for example, X percent. And this could either be a nominal rate of return or expressed in real terms. And as we said, for long-term planning, it should be done in real terms so we take into uh, account the effect of inflation. And again, uh, if you look at alternatively, the, re the return investment can be stated on a relative basis, for example, relative to a benchmark return. So the benchmark could be an equity uh, market index such as the S&P 500. So anyhow, uh, here are four um, return objectives as per the CFA uh, curriculum a few years ago. Number one is capital preservation, earning a return at least equal to the inflation rate. So we saw from our Ibbotson uh, data, if that was, if your only objective was to preserve your capital, you might uh, invest in T-bills because they've been able to protect their purchasing power, a return a little bit higher than the inflation rate, but not much more. If your uh, objective, return objective was current income, that is earning a return to generate income, normally to pay living expenses or some other planned spending uh, need. And so as you can see, we talked about total return here in the CFA uh, Investment Foundations, and that's why I wanted to bring this slide up. Total return is meeting a future need through both capital appreciation and current income. And then finally, the, the last uh, return objective is capital appreciation, which is earning a return that exceeds the rate of inflation, and it's the most risky objective. And, uh, and we saw that, you know, we've seen that from the different type of portfolios. We put return on the y-axis, uh, risk on the x-axis, 
and we looked at the different portfolios. The higher the return objective, the higher the risk uh, that needs to be accepted. So now we're moving on to risk tolerance because as we've said in the past, we can't only uh, look at return, we also have to look at risk, okay? So when we're talking about risk tolerance, we talk about two things. Number one, the ability to take risk, and that's based on certain client characteristics such as financial resources, the personal situation. And, uh, you know, what do you have the liquidity to save and invest? Uh, what is the uh, financial resources? What's the assets? What's the client net worth? Assets minus liabilities equals net worth when we talk about families. Assets minus liabilities equals equity when we studied the chapter on financial statements, okay? Well, if we're looking at a family, we're also going to do a uh, net worth calculation, understand the personal situation, and that's going to give us some uh, insight on the ability to take on risk, okay? When we, when we move and talk about the willingness to take on risk, that has to do with the financial expertise and the attitude. So investing experience, the attitude towards risk, the investment knowledge, all right? So investors typically have limits on how much risk they're willing and able to take with their investments. As noted earlier, there's a link between risk and return. Typically, the higher expected return, the higher the risks associated with that return, or the higher the risk taken, the higher the expected return, okay? So the investor's uh, risk tolerance is a function of his or her ability and willingness to take risk. The ability to take on risk depends on the situation of the investor, such as the balance between assets and liabilities and the time horizons. If investors have far more assets than liabilities, any losses that result from risk taking may not alter their lifestyle. If investors have a long horizon, they may have more scope to adjust their circumstances to cope with losses by saving more or waiting for markets to recover, although recovery and its timing cannot be guaranteed. Moving it over to willingness to take risk, it's related to the investor's psychology, which may be assessed using questionnaires completed by the investor. Willingness to take risk is often thought of as more important for individual investors, but even those who oversee institutional investments will have risk guidelines with, within which they must operate and that help define their ability and willingness to take risk. Some institutions, such as insurance companies and other financial intermediaries, may also face regulatory restrictions on how much risk they can take with their portfolio. There may be situations in which an investor's willingness to take risk and his or her ability to take risk differ. In such situations, the investment advisor should counsel, should educate the investor on risk and determine the appropriate level of risk to take in the portfolio, taking into account both the investor's ability and willingness to take risk. The lesser of the two risks should be used, um, should be the risk level of assumed. So here's just a little matrix to hopefully uh, help you better understand, uh, you know, the willingness and ability to take risks. So risk objectives are specifications for portfolio risk that reflect the risk tolerance of the client. And that risk tolerance is made up of uh, not only the willingness, but also the ability. So you can see here, willingness to take risk below average or above average, and ability to take risk below average or above average. So if we look here, if the uh, both the ability and willingness to take risk are below average, then it has to be a lower risk tolerance, okay? But if the client has a above average willingness to take on risk, so they have, and that's based on their psychology, they, they are willing to accept high risks they have, and they have a willingness to do it, but their ability is below average because of, you know, uh, high liabilities uh, or, uh, you know, uh, unstable job situation or whatever, all those characteristics that don't give you the ability to take on risk, shorter time horizon. Well, then, uh, you know, if there's a mismatch between the willingness and the ability, then education or resolution is required. You have to counsel the client. So that's why education is very important. Moving over here, if, uh, if a client has a very high ability to take on risk, so they have uh, you know, a very strong balance sheet, very high net worth, uh, but they have a, a below uh, average willingness, they've been investing in guaranteed investment certificates with very low rates of return, then again, there may be some education 
or resolution required where you can educate the client that they indeed have the ability to take on um, you know a higher risk but there's going to be some um, implications to that but long term on average this is the result that you're going to get now of course in this quadrant if the uh, client has both the willingness and the ability to take on uh, um, above average risk well then it's going to be uh, you know high risk tolerance is uh, is um, that the portfolio risk uh, specifications are going to be for a higher a higher risk tolerance. They ha the client has a, a above average ability to take on risk and the client has above average willingness to take on risk and that's why we took on uh, you know uh, a fairly high risk in the portfolio. So we're just going to do qu two quick practice questions from the learning ecosystem to help check our understanding on this uh, topic and so this one is at the difficult level and the question is when an investor's willingness and ability to take risk differ the investment advisor should counsel the investor to use a risk level based on the A, ability to take risk only, B, willingness to take risk only, or C, the lesser of the two risk levels. Okay, the correct answer is C. When investors' willingness and ability to take risk differ, the investment advisor should counsel the investor to use a risk level based on the lesser of the two risk levels. So you can see A and B are incorrect because both both the ability and willingness to take risk must be considered. And you can see here in A it said ability to take risk only, B willingness to take risk only. No, you need to consider the two. There might be some education uh, process that needs to happen. But anyhow, uh, C is correct. There may be situations in which an investor's willingness to take risk and his or her ability to take risk are different. In such situations, the investment advisor should counsel the investor about risk and determine the appropriate level of risk to take in the portfolio, taking into account both the investor's ability and willingness. And this is the key point here that they're saying is the lesser of the two risk levels should be the risk assumed. Again, with a bit of education, uh, that level may change based on uh, from the investor, but the lesser of the two risk levels should be used in the risk level assumed. This is from a CFA uh, level one database, but I just want to show you it's the, we're covering the same ground, and this is not uh, too difficult a question. It gives us some insight to what we're studying. And the question is, in preparing an investment policy statement, which of the following is most difficult to quantify? Remember, when we're gathering data, some of it's, uh, it's, it's quantitative and qualitative data. So this is asking, which of the following is most difficult to quantify? A, time horizon. B, ability to take on risk, or C, willingness to accept risk? So the correct answer is C. I think this question is really easy, so you know, hopefully you'll want to do the CFA Level 1 after successfully completing the uh, CFA Institute Investment Foundations program. Anyhow, in preparing an investment policy statement, the most difficult to quantify is the willingness to accept risk. We said measuring willingness to take risk, risk tolerance, risk aversion, is an exercise in applied psychology. Instruments attempting to measure risk attitudes exist, these questionnaires, but they are clearly less objective than measurements uh, of the ability to take on risk, like the net worth statement, assets minus liabilities equals net worth. That's fairly easy to quantify. Uh, ability to take on risk is based on relatively objective traits, such as expected income, time horizon, and existing wealth relative to liabilities. So we can quantify the time horizons, uh, ability to, to accept risk, we can quantify through uh, income, uh, income statement, balance sheet, cash flow, but the willingness is uh, more difficult to quantify. Now we're moving on to time horizon. The investor and advisor must be clear on the time horizon for investments. Some investors will need access to the funds from their portfolios in the short term, while others have a much longer time horizon. On the institutional side, for example, a property and casualty insurance company that expects to have to meet claims in the next few years will have a short horizon, whereas a sovereign wealth fund that is investing oil revenues for the benefit of future generations will have a long horizon, possibly decades. In the case of individual investors, someone who's planning on buying a new home or for paying for college in two or three years will have a short horizon for at least a portion of his or her investments. A 20-year-old saving for retirement will typically have a long horizon, probably more than 40 years. So the investment horizon has important implications for how much risk can be taken with a portfolio and the level of liquidity 
that may be required. Investors with longer time horizons should be able to take more risk because they have more time to adapt to their circumstances. History has shown that over time, markets go up more often than they go down, so an investor with a longer time horizon has more potential to accumulate positive performance. Longer-term investors are also better able to wait for markets to recover from a period of poor performance, although that recovery cannot be guaranteed. Liquidity is the ease with which an investment can be converted into cash. For example, an illiquid private equity investment will likely, will have a, with a likely payoff in 10 years would be unsuitable for an investor with a five-year time horizon. So this is my own slide. Uh, and again, because we're looking at time, this was from the JP Morgan Guide to the Markets as at September 30th, 2018. We've looked at this before. Uh, we're talking about time, diversification, and the volatility of returns. So down here we have one year, and then we have five-year rolling, 10-year uh, rolling average, and 20-year rolling averages. And again, we saw that in the short term, if we looked here at 100% in stocks, and they're using the S&P uh, 500, you can see the one year, and this is calendar years, the range of returns is from positive 47% uh, to negative 39, and that would have been 2008, because this is just looking at uh, 1950 to 2017. But we know uh, that's a calendar year. Peak to trough for the S&P 500 was more like 57, or 54%, 57%, 57%, uh, you know, uh, when we extend past the calendar year. Then if we look at the bonds, we can see that there's a less range of return. Best year, 43%. Worst is negative 8%. Okay, uh, and if we look at the average total return for the time period, uh, yes, uh, stocks 11.2% and bonds 5.9%. So they're looking at the growth of $100,000 over 20 years. If, you're, uh, if your objective, return objective, is capital growth, you're going to invest more in stocks, okay? If your uh, return objective is um, uh, to beat the level of inflation, but with less volatility and to provide some income, you, you may be investing more in bonds. And then here, we've got the 50-50 portfolio, which you can see is even uh, much less uh, um, uh, volatility. But the key thing here, we're talking about the time horizon, because long term on average, there's more positive returns than negative returns to the stock market. Economies have been uh, growing around the world that you can see the longer that we go, um, the less the uh, downside on, uh, you know, uh, with regards to the um, uh, five-year rolling returns. And as I said before, if you picked uh, the S&P 500 at any point in time and went 10 years uh, longer, there was uh, almost negative, uh, never a negative return. This was the 2008. It was such a down that you got the negative 1%. And in fact, if you go, if you had a 20-year uh, time horizon, uh, you, now you can't guarantee it, but you could say a very good probability based on the past that you're not going to have a negative return. The lowest uh, return, uh, you know, 20-year rolling average, 7%, 7 high 17, okay? Uh, so that is why the longer, uh, the longer your time horizon, the less chance of a loss, and the longer the time horizon, uh, it can increase your ability to take on risk, okay? So we're continuing with constraints, uh, common factors that affect all in, uh, investors. So some of the constraints we're going to look on this slide is the uh, liquidity constraints and uh, regulatory issues. Now, I must say that I uh, completed CFA Level 1, I think it was back in 2001. And uh, the constraints, I always memorized it as LLTTU, okay? So that was legal. And so here, I just want to show you that in the investment foundations are using regulatory issues, but I'd also call that legal and regulatory issues, okay? Uh, the second L was liquidity, which we see here. Uh, then we had time, which we just saw on the previous slide, tax, which we're going to see, and then it was the unique circumstances, okay? And that hasn't changed uh, for years and years and years. When we look at the constraints that are common factors that affect all investors, we were, I always was memorizing it as LLTTU, legal, liquidity, time, tax, unique circumstances, all right? So starting first with liquidity, investors vary in the extent to which they may need to withdraw money from their portfolios. 
They may need to make a withdrawal to fund a specific purchase or to generate a regular income stream. These needs have implications for the types of investments chosen. When liquidity is required, the investments will need to be able to convert it to cash relatively quickly and without too much cost, keeping transaction costs and charges in price low when the cash is needed. An individual may also require that a portion of the portfolio to be liquid to meet unexpected expenses. Moving to an institution, though, for an institution, the liquidity constraint typically reflects the institution's liabilities. For example, a pension fund may expect to begin experiencing a net cash outflows at a particular point in the future, i.e. when pension payments exceed new contributions to the plan and thus will need to sell off some of the portfolio investments to meet those needs, okay? So um, we saw that in terms of a question in the, in the learning ecosystem that for a pension plan, sometimes they're going to need to sell off some of the investments. They're going to do it to meet uh, liquid, liquidity needs when the uh, pension payments are exceeding the new contributions to the plan, okay? In terms of re legal and regulatory issues, some types of investors have external legal and regulatory requirements that apply to their portfolios. For example, in some countries and for some certain types of in institutions, there are restrictions on the proportion of the portfolio that can be invested overseas or in such risky assets in equities. Regulations on the holding of insurance companies are typically quite extensive. Moving on now to taxes. Tax circumstances vary among investors. Some type of investors are taxed on their investment returns and others are not. For example, in many countries, pension funds are exempt from tax on investment returns. Furthermore, the tax treatment of income and capital gains can vary. It is important to consider an investor's tax situation and the tax consequences of different investments. Investors should typically care about the returns they earn after taxes and fees because that is what is available to spend. For example, an investor who is subject to a higher tax on dividend income than capital gains will typically desire a portfolio of investments seeking capital growth, for example, from an increase in the value of the shares rather than from income, for example, uh, dividends from shares. Individuals may also face different tax circumstances for different parts of their wealth. For example, income and capital gains on assets held in a pension account, which has uh, restrictions on when it can be accessed, may be tax exempt or tax deferred. The investor may choose to hold assets expected to generate capital gains in a taxable investment account if capital gains are taxed at a lower rate than income. Where assets are located or held can significantly affect an investor's after-tax returns and wealth accumulation. So the last constraint that we're going to finish up with and finish this learning outcome statement on is um, unique circumstances. So many investors have particular requirements or constraints not captured by the standard categories discussed so far. Some investors have social, religious, or ethical preferences that affect how their assets can be invested. For example, investors may choose not to hold investments in companies whose activities they believe potentially harm the environment. Other investors may require investments that are consistent with certain religious beliefs. For example, some investors may not invest in conventional debt securities because they do not believe they comply with the Islamic law or Sharia investing. Investors may also have specific requirements that stem from the nature of their broader investment portfolio or financial circumstances. For example, an, an individual is employed by a company may want to limit investment in that company. Uh, they want diversification, which would help the employee reduce single company exposure and gain broader diversification. Interestingly, many individuals are actually inclined to boost their holdings in their employer shares on the grounds of loyalty or familiarity, despite the concentration risk that this strategy entails. Such a strategy can have severe consequences if the company fails or its financial position uh, declines. So, for example, many employees of Enron Corporation, a U.S. energy company, not only lost their jobs, but also suffered significant investment losses when Enron went bankrupt. So they lost their pension savings because they were self-directing uh, it into, uh, you know, large shares of Enron, 
or they've been receiving stock savings plans, stock options. Anyhow, they had a lot of Enron uh, stock. They didn't diversify out of it. The company went bankrupt, so they lost not only their jobs, but also their retirement savings, and that's quite a tragedy, okay? Institutional investors may also have unique and specific requirements as a result of their objectives and circumstances. For example, a medical foundation may want to avoid investing in tobacco stocks because it believes encouraging tobacco smoking is counter to its objectives of improving health. Learning outcome statement E is describe the rationale for and the structure of investment policy statements in serving client needs. Okay, so now we're moving on to the investment policy statement. And the investment policy statement, it's a key step in the portfolio management process. Without a full understanding of the client situation and requirements, it's unlikely that successful results will be achieved. So the IPS can take a variety of forms. A typical format will include the client's investment objectives and also list the constraints that apply to a client's portfolio. An IPS identifies client objective and constraints, has a clear statement of client risk tolerance, imposes investment discipline on both client and manager, it identifies risks, and it identifies a benchmark portfolio consistent with the client's preferences. Major components or uh, sections of an IPS would be, number one, description of client circumstances, two, the purpose of the IPS, three, duties and responsibilities of all parties, four, procedures to update uh, an IPS to resolve problems, five, investment objectives and constraints, six, investment guidelines, seven, evaluation of performance, the benchmark, and finally, eight appendices with the strategic asset allocation, uh, permitted deviations from that allocation, and uh, some comments regarding rebalancing procedures. So it is good practice to capture information about the client and the client's needs in an investment policy statement. The investment policy statement for both individual and institutional investors serves as a guide for the investor and investment manager or advisor regarding what is required of and acceptable in the investment portfolio. The IPS also forms the basis for determining what constitutes success in managing the portfolio. So the IPS should capture, the, uh, of course, the investor's objectives and any constraints that will apply to the portfolio. The investor and uh, manager should agree to the IPS and review it on a regular basis, typically once a year. It should also be reviewed when the client experiences a change in circumstances. Creating and reviewing an IPS is a good opportunity for the investment manager and client to discuss the client's goals. A common format for an IPS is to split it into sections covering objectives and constraints. Each section then has its own uh, subsections. So objectives, return requirements and risk to uh, tolerance, constraints, uh, LLTTU, you know, as I mentioned, time horizon, liquidity, legal and regulatory constraints, taxes, and unique circumstances. Although the standard form of an IPS covers objectives and constraints, many investors, especially institution, uh, institutions, will also include procedural and governance issues. So that's a big difference between an IPS for an institution versus one for an individual. Uh, an IPS for an institution will also include procedural and governance issues, okay? Uh, the IPS may set out the role of an investment committee, its structure and its authority. It may also set out the roles of the investment managers, the basis on which they'll be appointed, and the criteria on which they will be reviewed. An important role of the IPS is to provide information that is useful in determining the types and amount of assets in which to invest and the way the portfolio will be managed over time and the I IPS uh, serves as the basis for determining the appropriate portfolio strategies and asset allocations. So this slide is just focusing a little bit more on institutional investors in particular and the IPS. So it's saying here most institutional investors create an IPS. So in addition to the items that we've previously talked about, these uh, statements may uh, specify many of the following. So uh, number one, relative importance of capital preservation and capital growth. Two, asset classes in which the institution is allowed to invest. So for example, if you looked at the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is based in Abu Dhabi, there may be um, 
uh, certain um, industries that they're not allowed to invest in based on uh, certain um, unique, uh, you know, unique constraints. Uh, number three, um, there's going to be a target asset allocation that indicates what proportion of the investment funds will be invested in each asset class, whether leverage the use of debt or short positions are allowed. We can see with the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan, they are actually borrowing a little bit of money, okay, from the money market. It was that, that negative uh, money market when they were looking at the net assets. Assets minus liabilities equals net assets, okay? So some institutions do use debt. Um, you know, in some cases, short positions are allowed if they're investing in some hedge funds. So that all has to be uh, spelt out. Another thing is uh, how, how actively the institution will trade might be included, how investment decisions will be made, the process, the committees, and again, the benchmarks against which the institution will measure overall investment returns. So just very quickly, I'm at the uh, website for the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority. I've they have an excellent review. I've used this for, uh, for many years in some of my educational activities. So it's www.adia.ae, okay? So again, if you, you can get information here about the, uh, about the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, about the investments. But as I said, they, they, they have an excellent review. Okay, so I've downloaded that uh, Abu Dhabi Investment Authority and review for 2017. You can see one of the things that we see here, annualized rate of returns. So again, these are some of the best investment professionals in the world, and their 23-year uh, uh, returns at the end of 2017, 7%, uh, uh, very close to what it was after 2016. If you look at 20-year returns, 6.5%. So again, um, you know, not, not totally different than we saw with the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. 1,700 uh, employees, very, uh, again, these are the best and brightest minds in the industry. Then here, as I said, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, they're not going to release their assets under management, but they give you their guidelines for their uh, portfolio by asset class, okay? So you can see here, here's their portfolio by asset class. This is their long-term policy portfolio and the asset classes are developed equities, emerging market equities, small cap equities, so those are stocks. You can see the ranges, so for the developed equities the policy range is from a low of 32 percent to 42 percent. Emerging market equities making up uh, 10 percent of the portfolio to 20. Small cap equities from 1 to 5. So what does that tell us? It shows you that as a minimum 32 plus 10 plus 1 that 43% uh, of the portfolio is made up of equities. Then it moves on to government bonds and credit. Credit would be the bonds of companies and government bonds 10 to 20%, credit uh, 5, to, 5 to 10. So you can see on the bonds, 15%. Uh, not, not so different than this core portfolio that I've been talking about for any individual made up of cash. Uh, you can see cash is 0 to 10%, cash, stocks, and bonds. Now, because this is an institutional investor, you can see that they can get into the alternatives, and the alternatives comprise hedge funds and managed futures, and those alternatives are from 5 to 10%. Real estate, not unlike, um, you know, for individuals, it could be their principal home. Again, that's not included in investable assets. Uh, here, real, so institutional or individuals, uh, you know, an investment in real estate, uh, for the uh, for the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, real estate investments between five to ten percent of the portfolio. Private equity and infrastructure is typically things that individual investors, uh, you know, don't participate in unless they're uh, high net worth, ultra high net worth. But uh, institutional investors can, especially, uh, especially on the infrastructure. So you can see private equity two to eight percent, infrastructure one to five percent, relatively small. Uh, really, the key parts of the portfolio are the stocks and the bonds, okay? And a very important point over here is that 55% of Abu Dhabi Investment Authority's assets are managed by external fund managers whose activities are subject to careful oversight. So that would mean 45% is in-house, and that's what we were seeing that with institutional investors, uh, some of the investment professionals are going to be in-house, and some of it's going to be farmed out to external fund managers, and they give us the percentages here. And then finally, a very key point, which I uh, think is uh, fascinating and very important to point out, is that 50% of the 
of Abu Dhabi Investment Authority's assets are in are in invested in index replicating strategies. Where did we see those in index replicating strategies? We saw that on the chapter for investment vehicles, and we're talking about ETFs, exchange traded funds that aren't uh, the target is not to beat the index, but to just match the performance of the benchmark that they are replicating. So 50% of Abu Dhabi Investment Authority assets are invested in index replicating strategies. Uh, I, I, I love this chart. It shows you the uh, portfolio by asset class, and it shows you that 50% are in uh, basically ETFs. So I'll do a quick practice question to check our understanding. It's from the learning ecosystem classified at the expert level. And the question is, a difference in investment policy statements for institutional investors and individual investors most likely relates to the inclusion of A, client constraints, B, investment objectives, or C, procedural and governance issues. Wow, I think that question is a really easy one, actually, because if uh, you know, you're looking at investment policy statements for both individuals and institutional investors, they're going to have the investment objectives. They're going to have the client constraints. But as we mentioned, um, when we look at institutional investors, they are likely going to include, include procedural and government issues. So C is correct. Procedural and governance issues are constraints specific to many institutional investors. So this is the last slide with regards to the investment policy statement. And after that quick practice question, I just thought I'd put in a bit of a review because we have covered a lot. So again, the investment uh, policy statement split up between objectives and constraints. The objectives are the return objectives or return requirements. And you also have the risk tolerant or risk objectives. Okay. In terms of the return requirements or return objectives, those return objectives could be capital preservation, current income, total return, and capital appreciation. When we looked over at the risk objectives, we looked at the ability and, uh, and willingness to take on risk, and willingness is a little bit harder to quantify. Moving over to the constraints, remember I was saying LLTTU is how I always remember, memorized it. So is legal and re regulatory requirements, liquidity, time, tax, and unique circumstances, okay? Uh, and those are uh, some of the major categories that we see in the investment policy statement. And where are we headed with this? We're headed with this because once we've, uh, now we're going to move on from, you know, discovering the client's needs to moving over to the investment management part and doing the, uh, working on the portfolio selection, uh, designing the portfolio and then implementing it. Now this is my own slide, but I'm just tying together the end of this chapter and heading into the next one. So we're, it's just getting you, giving you a preview on the strategic asset allocation. And the strategic asset allocation is the set of exposures to uh, investment policy statement permissible asset classes that is expected to achieve the client's long-term objectives given the client's uh, investment constraints. So the strategic asset allocation is based on risks, returns, and correlations of asset classes. Correlations of returns of assets within an asset class uh, should be relatively high. We've seen that. Uh, stocks, um, <clears throat> stocks uh, you know, regardless of the industry or the, even the geography, are going to have a, a, ver a fairly high correlation. And correlations of returns between asset classes should be less than one or lower. Indeed, we've seen that in the past, that actually the correlation between stocks and bonds is in fact negative. So traditionally, investors have distinguished cash, equities, bonds, and real estate as the major asset classes. In recent years, this list has been expanded with private equity, hedge funds, and commodities. We saw that in investment vehicles. Uh, in addition, such assets as art and intellectual property rights may be considered asset classes for those investors prepared to take a more innovative approach and to accept some illiquidity. So there's a very good CFA article about investments of passion. It's becoming more common that people are investing in wine, stamps, art, jewelry, guitars, etc. These are called, uh, these are also assets. They're also investments, but they're, they're in a category of investments of passion, okay? So combining such new asset classes 
as well as hedge funds and private equity under the uh, uh, header alternative investments has become accepted practice and indeed we have had a chapter on alternative investments. Now this is my own slide. It's a crazy busy one but it's pulling together uh, things that we've seen in different chapters throughout uh, and as I said that's why I love this chapter because it's kind of bringing everything together because at the heart of it we're talking about building a portfolio you know portfolio management investment management creating some type of portfolio we went through the process so um, you know if we if we if we look at coming up with that strategic asset allocation we're looking we're combining the long-term capital market expectations and the uh, um, you know from and from the investment policy statement the clients objectives and constraints so moving over here on the left hand side the long-term market expectations in terms of expected returns variances and covariances well uh, the, the we can't predict that the future is going to be like the past but we do have some insight to historical returns and we looked at that at the Ibbotson SBBI yearbook which was looking at stocks bonds bills and inflation from 1926 to 2017 and we saw that small cap stocks had the highest uh, annual returns and these are uh, uh, compounded annual average returns but uh, but we don't only look at the returns we also look at the risk they all as measured by standard deviation so they had the highest returns the highest risk large cap stocks in around 10 percent okay um, so that is looking at, you know expected returns if it was doing on uh, you know based on past returns we may say that we're expecting from our stock portfolio expected returns of 10 percent and in terms of variance something like uh, you know perhaps 25 percent standard deviation although we can be subject to uh, you know um, uh, in the short term some some very uh, big changes anyhow uh, then uh, you know uh, we, we also looked at uh, in one of the videos here the JP Morgan guide to the markets from uh, September uh, 30th 2018 and we also looked at the asset class returns so it expanded a little bit from the Ibbotson SBBI where we're looking at stocks bonds and cash where you can see we looked at emerging market equities we looked here at real estate investment trusts uh, small cap commodities uh, um, uh, also you know they had the the uh, uh, developed market equities the large cap high yield uh, and then so you could see this is giving a picture's worth a thousand words as I said we've got it here by years from 2003 to 2017 so if you looked at small if you just pick a bright color like orange you can see the volatility here's a nice positive return 2008 was a uh, was a bit of a disaster everything was negative uh, but you can see the volatility there's a return there's a negative return there's a positive return there's a negative return so that's that's the, that's that's uh, that's volatility and uh, if we build a portfolio and it gave us the guidelines on the portfolio you can see there's a lot less um, volatility than some of these more uh, uh, volatile asset classes and if you looked here at the portfolio it had a pretty good return uh, relative to the risk so again if we did a return to risk ratio we'd see that the portfolio is maybe uh, quite efficient that's the benefits of diversification pretty good return with a lot less volatility so how do we diversify our assets we got to look at our correlations and that was another th bit of information we could get from the JP Morgan uh, uh, um, guide to the markets it had the correlation matrix we went across the uh, US large caps we could see negative correlation to bonds anything with a correlation less than one is good we could see the real estate investment trusts and investment vehicles those are listed on exchanges so pretty high correlation to to uh, US large cap stocks because a rising tide uh, lifts all boats so as the markets raise it's affecting not only real estate investment trusts but also stocks you know not only stocks but also real estate investment trusts anyhow so once we uh, come up with uh, for our individual investor uh, our strategic asset allocation then we know that uh, you know in the short term because we see the, these uh, range of returns for different asset classes in some cases there's a tactical asset allocation and I got this from uh, Credit Suisse um, you know, we've shown this uh, in a previous video and the uh, so the dif the difference between strategic asset allocation and tactical 
is that with strategic asset allocation, that's the long-term investment strategy, five to 10 years. And the assumption are, are the, is that the markets are efficient, assets are at fair value, and the, you're gonna define a benchmark, and uh, the required input is the long-term risk and return assumptions. Now over here, as we go more tactical, is taking advantage of the short to medium-term opportunities, and you can definitely see here from the JP Morgan asset class returns, if you can forecast the future, uh, you know, uh, if you've got some skill in that, you might be able to forecast that small cap equities are going to go from a negative year to a very positive year and start to overweight, underweight different asset classes. That's the nature of uh, tactical asset allocation. It's being active. It's active management. And uh, one of the assumptions is that markets uh, may be inefficient and assets are not at fair value. So your analysis is is better than the other people, okay? And that you're, you're, you're choosing some mispriced securities. And uh, so the required input is models to identify the misvaluation of assets. So again, this is my second to last slide. I just wanna show you, that's why I love these two chapters because it's starting to tie together things that we saw in quant. Why do we need to study standard deviation? Uh, the chapter on stocks, understanding the difference between large cap, small cap stocks, and some of the indexes that measure, and some of the returns. Then we we had a chapter on bonds. What are the characteristics of, in terms of bonds, in terms of their uh, return and risk characteristics, and their correlation to stocks, and how we combine them into portfolios ultimately. And a secure portfolio is gonna be more heavily weighted in bonds than it is in stocks. And if your objective is, is uh, aggressive growth of your capital, you're going to be more heavily weighted into stocks, but in the short term, you're going to have to accept some some higher volatility in some years where the stocks are down. Okay, so uh, and again, this uh, quite a busy slide, lots of information. But the, if you've been doing the chapters in order, these are all things that you've seen at different parts throughout the course, and it's really now all starting to gel, and ultimately the um, you know the creation and implementation of the portfolio which is a, a, you know, a, pretty, a pretty important part of an, uh, the investment management industry, portfolio management. So this is the last slide for this topic, and it's my own. And again, it's been included in a previous um, video, but I think it's so important. And it's some words of wisdom and advice from uh, Jack Bogle, okay? And his, uh, his message is stick to simplicity, don't complicate the process. Basic investing is simple. A sensible asset allocation is stocks, bonds, and cash. Perhaps the most critical decision you face is getting the proper allocation of assets in your investment uh, portfolio. Stocks are designed to provide growth of capital and growth of income. Uh, that's through dividends. While bonds are for conservation of capital and current income, once you get the balance right, then just hold tight. No matter how high a greedy stock market flies, nor how low a frightened market plunges. And there's a lot of uh, academic debate on rebalancing. Uh, and so anyhow, there's different philosophies on rebalancing. There's different advice. Um, Jack Bogle is basically saying, don't rebalance a lot. Once you got your balance right, hold tight, okay? And uh, change the allocation only as your investment profile changes. And finally, the paradox is that in these times of increasing complexity, simplicity underlies the best investment strategy. This is the conclusion for this video. The topic was Module 6, Serving Client Needs, Chapter 16, Investors and Their Needs, for the CFA Institute Investment Foundations Program. Thank you.